Chapter 11. Space-Time and Time-Space We live in a three-dimensional universe, uni meaning one, where everything that exists is made up of people, objects, places, and time. For the most part, it's a dimension of particles and matter. Through our senses, we experience these things as form, structure, mass, and density. If I place an ice cube, your cell phone, or an apple pie in front of you, for example, you could not experience any of these objects without your senses. It's your senses that give rise to your experience of physical reality. While the ice cube, cell phone, and apple pie all have height, width, and depth, they only exist to you because you can see, hear, taste, smell, and feel them. If you lost your five senses, or they were simultaneously eliminated, you would be incapable of experiencing these physical objects because you would have no awareness of them. They would literally not exist to you, because in this three-dimensional reality, you can't experience them without your senses. Or can you? According to astrophysics, in this realm of three dimensions, the known universe, let's call it space-time reality, there's an infinite amount of space. Take a moment to ponder that concept. From the small perch where we sit staring out into the universe, when we look up at the night sky, we only see a sliver of the universe. It appears to us as infinite, and yet infinite is even bigger than that. In other words, in the realm of space-time, space is eternal. It has no end and goes on forever. But what about time? The way you and I typically experience time is by moving our bodies through space. For example, it might take you five minutes to set this book down, walk to the kitchen, pour a glass of water and return. This occurs because a thought that originated in your mind created a vision of what you were going to do in the kitchen. You acted on that thought, and consequently, you experienced time by moving from one point to another through space. Before you walked to the kitchen and as you were sitting in your chair, when you became conscious of the kitchen in relation to where you were sitting, you experienced a separation of two points of consciousness, where you sat and the kitchen. To close the gap between those two points of consciousness, you moved your body through space, and that took time. It makes sense then that the greater the space or distance between two points, the greater the time it takes to get from one point to the other. Conversely, the faster the speed at which you travel between these two points, the shorter the amount of time it takes. This measurement of the time it takes an object to move through space is the foundation for Newtonian physics, or classical mechanics. In the Newtonian world, if we know certain properties about an object, such as its force, acceleration, direction, speed, and the distance it will travel, we can make time-based predictions. Therefore, Newtonian physics is based on knowns and predictable outcomes. We can say, then, that when there's a separation between two points of consciousness, as you move from one point of consciousness to another point of consciousness, you are collapsing space. As a result of collapsing space, you experience time. Take a look at figure 11.1 .1 to further understand the relationship between space and time in our three-dimensional world. Here's another example. If I'm writing this book and I want to finish this chapter, it's going to take time. I may not have to move my body very much through space, but I still experience time. Why? Because where I presently am in the process of writing this chapter represents one point in consciousness, and finishing the chapter represents another. The completion of this chapter represents a future moment, separate from the present moment. The space between, the closing of the gap between these two points in consciousness, is the experience of time. If you look at figure 11.1 .1 again, it will help you gain a better understanding about time. To achieve my desired goal of arriving at the end of the chapter, I repeatedly have to do something. This requires me to use my senses to interact and move through my environment with a coordinated set of behaviors. And again, this takes time. If I cease writing and do something else, such as watch a movie, it's going to take more time for me to reach my intended result. Therefore, to achieve my goal of completing this chapter, I must consistently align my actions to match my intentions. In this material world of three dimensions, because we use our senses to navigate space, we place most of our attention on physical things such as people, objects and places. They all are made up of matter, and they are localized, meaning they occupy a position in space and time. These all represent points of consciousness from which we experience separation. For instance, when you observe your best friend sitting across the table from you, or look at your car parked in the driveway, you notice the space between you and your friend or the car. As a result, you feel separate from them. You are here, 
and your friend or the car is there. In addition, if you have dreams and goals, then where you are in the present moment and where your dreams exist as a reality in your future also creates the experience of separation. It's safe to say then that 1. In order for us to navigate this three-dimensional reality, we need our senses. 2. The more we use our senses to define reality, the more we experience separation. 3. Because most of this three-dimensional reality is sensory-based, space and time create the experience of separation from everyone, everything, every place, and every body in every time. 4. All things material occupy one position in space and time. That's called locality in physics. In this chapter, we are going to explore and contrast two models of reality, space-time and time-space. Space-time is the physical Newtonian world based on knowns, predictable outcomes, matter, and the three-dimensional universe in which we live, which is made up of infinite space. Time-space is the non-physical quantum world, an inverse reality based on unknowns, endless possibilities, energy, and the multidimensional multiverse where we also live which consists of infinite time. I'm going to challenge your understanding and perception of the nature of reality, because if you're going to experience the mystery of self as a dimensional being, you're going to need a roadmap to get there. Stress and the consequences of living in a perpetual state of survival. Because we use our senses to observe and determine physical reality, we identify as a body living in space and time, yet separate from everything in our environment. Over time, this interaction creates the experience of our identity. Throughout our lives, via the different interactions we have at certain times and places with people, things, and objects, our identity evolves into a personality. The quality of these interactions with our external environment creates lasting memories, and these memories shape who we become. We call this process experience, and it is life's experiences that shape who we are. And as you know, the majority of people's personality is based on past experiences. As you learned in Chapter 8, to our brains, the material objects, things, people and places that we perceive daily occur to us as patterns, and the recognition of these patterns is called memory. If the self is created from memories of past experiences, then memories are based on knowns. Therefore, most of our three-dimensional world is based on knowns. This is where most of us focus our attention. When you align everything material in your external world with the memories of your past experiences, you recognize them as familiar. You're matching a physical reality with a set of neurological networks in your brain. This is called pattern recognition, and it's the process whereby most people perceive reality through a lens of the past. We could say, then, that we're materialists not only living in this dimension, but also enslaved to and limited by it, because we've defined ourselves as a body living in an environment at certain times, and our focus is more on matter and less on energy. From a quantum perspective, we're keeping our attention on the physical particle, matter, instead of the immaterial wave of possibilities, energy. This is how we become immersed in this three-dimensional reality. When stress is thrown into the equation, our body begins to draw from the invisible electromagnetic field of energy around us to produce chemistry. The greater the frequency, intensity, and duration of the stress, the more energy our body consumes. The very nature of these chemicals endorses our senses causing us to pay attention to matter and knowns. As this vital field of energy around our body shrinks, we feel more like matter and less like energy. In fact, when our frequency slows down, our bodies become more dense as we run out of energy. As we've discussed, this is fine for the short term when danger, crisis, or a predator is lurking around the corner. In fact, the fight-or-flight response has been a cornerstone of our evolution. In this state, stress chemicals heighten our senses, narrowing our focus to whatever matter in our environment represents potential danger. When this happens, our neocortex, the part of our brain involved in sensory perception, motor commands, spatial reasoning and language, fires and becomes aroused. For survival purposes, this narrows our focus on our body and the external threat, causing us to become preoccupied by the time between the moment of the perceived threat and the moment we reach physical safety, both of which are points of consciousness. The more we experience stress, the more we feel separation. As you read in Chapter 2, the long-term effect of living in survival mode is that we begin to thrive on and become addicted to these stress chemicals. The more addicted we are to them, the more we believe we are our bodies that are local, that is, that are living in a particular place in space 
and occupying a particular position in linear time. The result is a manic, frenetic state where we continuously shift our attention from one person to one problem, to one thing, to one place in our environment. The evolutionary trait that once protected us now works against us, and we live in a constant high alert, obsessing about time. Because we view our external environment as unsafe, all of our attention is on our environment. As our outer world now appears more real than our inner world, we're addicted to someone or something in our external environment, and the longer we live in this state, the more our brain moves into high beta brainwaves. And as you know by now, prolonged high beta brainwaves cause us to feel pain, anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, judgment, impatience, aggression, and competition. As a result, our brainwaves become incoherent, and so do we. When the emotions of survival have a hold on us, we need the conditions in our external world, our problems with different people, financial hardships, fear of terrorism, disdain for our job, to reaffirm our addiction to those emotions. These emotional addictions cause us to become preoccupied by whatever we think might be causing the upset in our environment, whether it be someone or something, and as a result, the survival gene switches on. Now we're living in a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you understand that where you place your attention is where you place your energy, you know that the stronger the emotional reaction associated with the cause, the more you will consistently place all your attention on a person, thing, or problem in your external world. When you do this, you are giving quite a bit of your power away to someone or something. Now all your attention and energy is anchored in this three-dimensional realm of the material, and your emotional state is causing you to continuously reaffirm your present reality. You can become emotionally attached to the reality you really want to change. This mismanagement of your energy keeps you enslaved to the world of the knowns, trying to predict the future based on the past. What's more, when you're in the survival state, the unknown or the unpredictable is a scary place. So for you to truly make changes in your life, you would have to step into the unknown, and if you don't, nothing ever really changes. The Newtonian 3D space-time reality. Living as a somebody with something, somewhere in some time. If feelings and emotions are a record of the past, and those feelings are driving your hardwired thoughts and behaviors, you'll keep repeating your past and therefore become predictable. Now you're firmly ensconced in the Newtonian world because Newtonian physics is based on predictable outcomes. The more you live in stress, the more you are simply matter trying to affect matter, matter trying to fight, force, manipulate, predict, control, and compete for outcomes. As a result, everything you want to change, manifest, or influence is going to take a lot of time, because in this space-time reality, you have to move your physical body through space to create the outcomes you want. The more you are living in survival and using your senses to define reality, the more you experience separation from a new future. Between where you are presently, as one point of consciousness, and where you want to be, as another point of consciousness, lies a very long distance. Not to mention that your constant obsession on how it's going to happen is based on how you think and predict it should happen. But if you're predicting, your thinking is based on knowns, so there's no room for an unknown or new possibility in your life. If you are trying to buy a house, for example, you need to save for a down payment, look for a house, get a loan, go through the application process, beat out other buyers, and then spend 30 years dragging your body back and forth to work, through space, trying to pay it off. These two points in consciousness, having the idea to buy the house, and having the house with the mortgage paid off, are going to take time to intersect. In a similar way, if you want a new relationship, you might go online, set up a profile, scroll through countless other profiles, make a list of people to reach out to, contact each one, and eventually go on many dates in the hope of finding someone intriguing. If you want a new job, you might take the time to create a resume, search for open positions, and go on interviews. What these processes have in common is they require time, which you experience as linear. You may get what you want, but the more you live in survival, the more time it's going to take because you're matter trying to influence matter, and there's a distinct separation in space and time between where you are and where you want to be. We can agree, then, that in this three-dimensional reality, within your experience of time, there's a definite past, present, and future. 
Since you live in linear time, you also experience a separation from time because the past, present, and future appear as separate moments in time. You are here, and your future is there. Figure 11.2 graphically represents how the past, present, and future all exist as distinct, discontinuous moments. As I said earlier, thanks to Newtonian physics, we've unraveled the natural laws of force, acceleration, and matter, allowing us to predict outcomes. If we know the general direction, velocity, and rotation of an object traveling through space, for the most part, we can predict where it's going to end up and how long it will take. This is why we can travel from New York to Los Angeles by plane, predict how long it's going to take to get there, and know where the plane will land. Within the understanding of Newtonian physics and this three-dimensional world we live in, many of us spend most of our lives focusing our attention outward on trying to become a someone, have some body, own some things, go somewhere, and experience something in some time. When we don't have the things we want, we experience lack, and lack and separation cause us to live in a state of duality and polarity. It's natural for us to want what we don't have. In fact, this is how we create things. When we experience separation from our future desires, we think and dream of what we want, and then set about performing a series of actions in linear time to get them. If we're always under financial stress, for example, we want money. If we have a disease, we want health. If we feel lonely, we want a relationship or companionship. Because of this experience of duality and separation, we are driven to create, and this is how we naturally evolve and grow toward our dreams. But if we are matter, focused on matter, trying to influence matter to get money, health, love, and so on, as we've established, it's going to take quite a bit of time and energy. When we finally attain what we're seeking, the emotion we feel from the fruition of our creation, or the meeting of those two points of consciousness, satiates the sense of lack we formerly experienced. When the new job comes, we feel secure. When the new relationship manifests, we feel love and joy. As we heal, we feel more whole. If we are living in this state, we are waiting for something or someone outside of us to change how we feel internally. Once we feel relief from the experience of lack, because we are embracing the emotion correlated with the manifestation of the external event, we pay close attention to whomever or whatever caused the relief. This cause and effect forms a new memory, and to some degree, we evolve. When something in our world doesn't happen, or seems to be taking a long time to happen, we experience more lack because we feel even more separate from what we are trying to create. Now our own emotional state of lack, frustration, impatience and separation is keeping our dreams at a distance, further increasing the time it will take for our desired outcome to occur. From somebody to nobody. From someone to no one. From something to no thing. From somewhere to nowhere and from some time to no time. If Newtonian laws are an outward expression of the physical material laws of space-time, a dimension where there's more space than time, we could say, in a sense, that quantum laws are the inverse. The quantum is an inward expression of the laws of nature, an invisible field of information and energy that unifies everything material. This immaterial field organizes, connects, and governs all the laws of nature. It is a dimension where there's more time than space. In other words, it's a dimension where time is eternal. As you learned in chapters 2 and 3, when we take our attention off people and things at certain places in our external world, no longer placing our attention on our body and ceasing to think about time and schedules, we become no body, no one, no thing, nowhere, and in no time. We do this through a process of disconnecting from our body, our identity, our gender, our disease our name, our problems, our personal relationships, our pain, our past, and so on. This is what it means to get beyond the self, to go from the consciousness of somebody to nobody, from the consciousness of someone to no one, from the consciousness of something to no thing, from the consciousness of somewhere to nowhere, and from the consciousness of being in some time to being in no time. See figure 11.3 and take a glance at figure 11.4. As we move from a narrow focus to an open focus and begin to surrender all aspects of self, we move away from the external world of people, things, places, schedules, to-do lists, and so on, and turn our attention to the inner world of energy, vibration, frequency, and consciousness. Our research shows that when we take our attention off objects and matter and instead 
open our focus to energy and information. Different parts of the brain work together in harmony. The result of this unification of the brain is that we feel more whole. When we do this properly, our heart begins to open, beat more rhythmically, and thus become more coherent. As the heart moves into coherence, so too does our brain. And because our identity is out of the way, meaning we've gotten beyond our body, a particular place in our known environment and time, the act of eliminating those things causes us to move to alpha and theta brainwave patterns, and we connect with the autonomic nervous system. As the ANS becomes activated, its job is to restore order and balance, causing coherence and wholeness in our heart, brain, body, and energy field. This coherence is then reflected in all aspects of our biology. It is in this state where we begin to connect to the quantum, or unified field. From the illusion of separation to the reality of oneness. If Newtonian physics explains the physical laws of nature and the universe on a grand scale, the gravitational force of the sun upon planets, the speed with which the apple falls from the tree, and so on, the quantum world deals with the fundamental nature of things at their smallest scale, such as atomic and subatomic particles. Newtonian laws are physical constants of nature, so the Newtonian world is an objective world of measurability and predictable outcomes. Quantum laws, however, deal with the unpredictable and the unseen, the world of energy, waves, frequency, information, consciousness, and all spectrums of light. Governing this world is an unseen constant, a single field of information called the unified field. We can think of the Newtonian world as dealing with the objective, where mind and matter are separate, and of the quantum world as dealing with the subjective, where mind and matter are unified by energy, or better yet, where mind and matter are so connected that it's impossible to separate the two. In the quantum or unified field, there's no separation between two points of consciousness. It is the domain of oneness or unity consciousness. Whereas in our three-dimensional reality, space is infinite, in the quantum world, time is infinite. If time is infinite and eternal, it's no longer linear, meaning there is no separation of past or future. With no past or future, everything is happening right now, in this eternal present moment. Because time is infinite in this time-space reality, as we move through time, we experience space or spaces. In the material world of things, when we move through space, we experience time. Yet in the immaterial quantum world of energy and frequency, the opposite is true. In the world of space-time, as we increase or decrease the speed with which we go from point A to point B, the time it takes to get there changes. In the world of time-space, as we become aware of an increase or decrease in the speed of the frequency or vibration of energy, we can go from one space to another space or from one dimension to another dimension. When we collapse space, we experience time in the material reality. When we collapse time, we experience spaces or dimensions in the immaterial reality. Each of those individual frequencies is carrying information or a level of consciousness that we experience as different realities as we become aware of them. In figure 11.5, you can see that as you move through time, you experience different dimensions in the eternal present moment. In space-time, you experience the environment with your body, your senses and time. Time appears linear because you are separate from objects, things, people and places, as well as the past and the future. In time-space, however, you experience this realm with your awareness, as a consciousness, not as a body with senses. This realm exists beyond your senses. You access this domain when you are totally in the present moment, so there is no past or future, just one long now. Since your awareness is beyond the realm of matter, because you have taken all of your attention off matter, you can become aware of different frequencies all carrying information, and these frequencies allow you to have access to different unknown dimensions. So if you are in a realm above the senses and unfolding as a consciousness into the energy of the unified field, you can experience many possible dimensional realities. I know that this is a big bite to take in all at once, so hang in there. If you are confused, it means you're about to learn something new. When I say that as you move through time you experience space or spaces, I mean all possible dimensions and possible realities. We could say then that in this time-space reality, all possible spaces or dimensions exist in an infinite time. This is the unified field, the realm of possibility unknowns and new potential realities, all of which exist in endless time, which is every time. 
Let's think of it another way. Everybody I know is always saying that they want or need more time to get more things accomplished. If you add more time, you could create more experiences, do more things, and therefore get more things done. This would mean more possibilities could happen and you could live more of life. So now imagine that there was an infinite amount of time because the past and the future no longer exists, so time is standing still. And you had all the time you needed. Wouldn't you agree that you could have endless possible experiences and therefore could live many lives? We could say then that an infinite number of experiences would be available to you, equal to your imagination. To say it yet another way, if time is eternal, then more spaces can exist in that infinite time. If we keep elongating or making more time, it makes sense that we can fit more spaces in time. If there is an infinite time, then there are infinite spaces we can fit in time, which are endless possibilities, potential realities, dimensions and experiences. In the quantum field, there is no separation of past or future because everything that is, exists in the eternal now or the eternal present moment. If everything that is exists unified or connected in the quantum field, then its infinite frequencies contain information about every body, every one, every thing, everywhere, and every time. As your consciousness begins to merge with the consciousness and energy of the unified field, you will go from the consciousness of somebody to the consciousness of nobody to the consciousness of everybody, from the consciousness of someone to the consciousness of no one to the consciousness of everyone, from the consciousness of something, to the consciousness of no thing, to the consciousness of everything, from the consciousness of somewhere, to the consciousness of nowhere, to the consciousness of everywhere, and from the consciousness of being in some time, to the consciousness of being in no time, to the consciousness of being in every time. Take a look at figure 11.6. The Atom, Fact and Fiction to help you understand how the quantum field is constructed, you first need to revisit the possibilities that exist in the atom. When we reduce matter to its smallest unit of measurement, we get the atom, and the atom vibrates at a very high frequency. If we could peel back the atom like an orange, we'd find a nucleus and subatomic particles such as protons, neutrons, and electrons. But for the most part, we'd find that it's 99.9999999999999% empty space or energy as you read earlier. Take a look at figure 11.7. .7. On the left we see the classical model of the atom that we were taught in grade school. But this is in fact an outdated model. In actuality, electrons don't move in fixed rotations around the nucleus like planets orbiting the sun. Instead, as you see on the right, the space around the nucleus is more like an invisible field or a cloud of information. And as we know, all information is made up of light, frequency and energy. To get an understanding of just how small these subatomic particles are, if the nucleus of an atom were increased to the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, the size of the electron would be equal to the size of a pea. Meanwhile, the space where the electron could exist would be 85,000 square miles. That's twice the size of Cuba. That's a lot of empty space for the electron to exist in. According to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we never know where the electron is going to appear in the electron cloud yet from nothing comes something. This is why quantum physics is so exciting and unpredictable. The electron is not always physical matter. Rather, it exists as the energy or as the probability of a wave. It is only through the act of observation by an observer that it appears. Once an observer, mind, comes along and looks for it, the act of observation, directed energy, causes all that potential energy to collapse into an electron, matter. Thus it manifests from the realm of infinite possibilities, an unknown, to a known. It becomes local in space and time. When the observer is no longer observing it, the electron turns back into possibility. That's the wave function. In other words, it turns back into energy, returning to the unknown and to its own agenda. When it turns back to energy and possibility, it becomes non-local. In the realm of the quantum, mind and matter are indivisible. Therefore, if Newtonian physics is the world of the predictable, the quantum is the world of the unpredictable. When we close our eyes in meditation and open our focus to infinite space, this is exactly what we are doing. We are putting more of our attention on energy, space, information and possibility rather than on matter. 
we are becoming less aware of the material realm and more aware of the immaterial realm. We are investing our energy into the unpredictable and unknown and disinvesting our attention and energy from the predictable and the known. Each time we do this, we develop a deeper understanding of what the unified field is. Before we go any further, let's briefly review what we just learned. Take a moment to review figure 11.8. The three-dimensional Newtonian world is made up of objects, people, places, matter, particles and time, basically most of the nouns, or everything we know in our external world. And in this world, there's more space than time. As a body, we use our senses to define this infinite space we live in, a universe of form, structure, dimension and density. This is the realm of the known and predictable. Because we experience the material universe with our senses, our senses provide us with information that occurs as patterns in our brain, which we recognize as structures, and it is through this process that things in our external environment become knowns. It is also through this process that we become a somebody, a someone with some things in some place and in some time. Finally, because we experience the universe with our senses, we experience separation. Therefore, this is the realm of duality and polarity. Now review figure 11.9. If the Newtonian world is a material world defined by the senses, in the quantum world the opposite is true. This is an immaterial world defined by nonsense. In other words, there's nothing sensory based here, and there's no matter. Whereas the Newtonian world is based on predictable knowns such as matter, particles, people, places, things, objects and time, this is an unpredictable dimension made up of light, frequency, information, vibration, energy and consciousness. If our three-dimensional world is a dimension of matter, where there's more space than time, the quantum world is a dimension of antimatter, a place where there's more time than space. Because there is more time than space, all possibilities exist in the eternal present moment. Whereas the three-dimensional world is our universe, meaning one reality, the quantum world is a multiverse, meaning many realities. If the space-time reality is based on separation, then the immaterial quantum world, or unified field, is based on oneness, connectedness, wholeness and unity, non-locality. In order for us to go from our known space-time, three-dimensional universe, a universe made up of matter where we experience duality and polarity, to the unknown time-space, five-dimensional, multiverse, a place where there is no matter, but instead light, information, frequency, vibration, energy and consciousness, we have to cross a bridge. That bridge is the speed of light. When we become pure consciousness and become no body, no one, no thing, nowhere, in no time, we are crossing that threshold from matter to energy. When Einstein introduced the equation E equals mc squared in his theory of special relativity, for the first time in the history of science, he demonstrated from a mathematical standpoint that energy and matter are related. What converts matter to energy is the speed of light, which means anything material traveling faster than the speed of light leaves our three-dimensional reality and turns into immaterial energy. In other words, in the three-dimensional world, the speed of light is the threshold for matter or anything physical to retain its form. No thing can travel faster than the speed of light, not even information. Anything traveling from one point to another that is traveling slower than the speed of light is going to take time. Therefore, the fourth dimension is time. Time is the nexus that connects the three-dimensional world to the fifth-dimensional world and beyond. Once something is traveling faster than the speed of light, there is no time or no separation between two points of consciousness because every thing, material, becomes energy. This is how you go from three dimensions to five dimensions, from a universe to the multiverse, from this dimension to all dimensions. Let me give you an example to help simplify this complex idea. French physicist Alain Aspect performed a famous quantum physics experiment in the early 1980s called the Bell Test Experiments. In the study, scientists entangled two photons, causing them to bond together. They then shot the two photons in opposite directions, creating distance and space between them. When they influenced one photon to disappear, the other photon vanished at exactly the same time. This experiment was a cornerstone study in the breakthrough of quantum physics because it proved that Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't completely correct. What it showed was that there is a unifying field of information existing beyond three-dimensional space and time that connects all matter, 
If the two particles of light were not connected by some invisible field of energy, it would have taken time for information to travel from one local point in space to the other local point in space. According to Einstein's theory, if one particle disappeared, the other particle should disappear a moment later, unless they were occupying the same space at the same time. Even if the second photon was affected a millisecond later, because they were separated by space, time would have played a factor in relaying the information. This would have reaffirmed that the ceiling of this physical reality is the speed of light, and everything material that exists here is separate. Because the two particles vanished at exactly the same time, it proved that all matter, bodies, people, things, objects, places, and even time are connected by frequency and information in a realm beyond three-dimensional reality and time. Everything beyond the material is unified in a state of oneness. The information was communicated between those two photons non-locally. Since there is no separation between two points of consciousness in the five-dimensional reality, there is no linear time. There is only all times. Mystical quantum physicist David Bohm called the realm of the quantum the implicate order, where everything is connected. He called the explicit order the material realm of separation. If you look at figures 11.8 and 11.9 again, it will help you to get your mind around both worlds. When you take your attention off being somebody, someone, something, somewhere, in some time, and you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, in no time, you are becoming pure consciousness. Your consciousness merges with the unified field, which is made only of consciousness and energy, where you connect to the self-organizing consciousness of everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, in every time. Thus, as you surrender as an awareness, without your senses, into this field of oneness where there is no separation, and you keep going deeper into the void or blackness, because nothing physical exists there, you, as a consciousness, become less separate from the consciousness of the unified field. If you can keep becoming more conscious and aware of it, and keep paying attention to it, you are investing your energy in it, and your attention directly at it. Thus, as you keep moving toward it, you will feel less separation and more wholeness. Finally, since only the eternal present moment exists in the unified field, because there is no linear time, only all time, the consciousness and energy of the unified field that is observing all matter into form is always in the present eternal moment. Therefore, in order for you to connect and unify with it, you will have to be completely in the present moment as well. If you review figure 11.10, it shows how you can collapse your own separation and individual consciousness to experience the oneness and wholeness of the unified field. One last point about the speed of light. In this realm of the material world, visible light is a frequency based on polarity, electrons, positrons, photons, and so on. If you look ahead a bit at figure 11.11, according to the scale, approximately one-third of the way up from the slowest frequency is where the division of light takes place. Above this wave or frequency is where matter goes from form to energy and singularity, and below this frequency are division and polarity. When the division of light takes place, photons, electrons, and positrons come into being because the visible light field holds the information template of matter as organized frequency in patterns of light. This division of light is where the Big Bang occurred, where singularity became duality and polarity, where the universe eventually appeared as organized information and matter. That's why this void is eternal blackness. There is no visible light. Because matter vibrates at such a slow frequency, to enter the time-space dimension or the unified field, you can't enter as a body or matter, so you must become no body. You can't take your identity, so you're going to have to become no one. You can't take things, so you must become no thing. You can't be somewhere, so you're going to have to get to nowhere. Finally, if you're living by a familiar past or predictable future where time appears linear, to get to the place of time-space, you're going to have to experience no time. How do you do this? You keep placing your attention on the unified field, not with your senses, but with your awareness. As you change your consciousness, you raise your energy. The more you become aware of this invisible field, the more you're moving further away from the separation of matter and closer to oneness. Now you're in the quantum, or the unified field. This is the realm of information that connects every body, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. The unified field, becoming everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, in every time. Matter is very dense. 
and because of its density, it vibrates at the slowest frequency in the universe. In figure 11.11, you see that as you raise matter's frequency by speeding it up faster and faster, matter as we know it dematerializes into energy. At some point just beyond the visible light spectrum, above the realm of duality and polarity, any information about matter converts to more unified energy. As you can see, the higher the frequency, the more orderly and coherent that energy becomes. At this level of frequency and energy, duality and polarity unify to become one. We call this love or wholeness because there is no longer any division or separation. It is where positive and negative join, where male and female unite, where the past and future merge, where good and bad no longer exist, where right and wrong no longer apply, where opposites become one. As you continue up this scale away from matter and separation, you continue to experience greater and greater degrees of wholeness, order and love. The orderliness of this more coherent energy is carrying information, and that information is more and more love. If you continued speeding matter up even faster, eventually it would be vibrating so fast as a frequency that it would exist as a straight line. Infinite frequencies exist in that line, which means infinite possibilities exist there as well. This is the zero-point field, or the point of singularity of the quantum, an omnipresent, ubiquitous field of information that exists as energy and frequency that is observing all of reality into order from a single point. We could call this the mind of God, unity consciousness, source energy, or whatever nomenclature you want to use to define the self-organizing principle of the universe. This is the place where all potentials or possibility exists as a thought, the ultimate source of a loving intelligence and an intelligent love that is observing all of this physical reality into form. Therefore, the greater the frequency we experience, the greater the energy. The greater the energy, the greater the information we have access to. The greater the information, the greater the consciousness. The greater the consciousness, the greater the awareness. The greater the awareness, the greater the mind. The greater the mind, the greater ability we have to affect matter. In the hierarchy of universal laws, quantum laws trump Newtonian or classical laws. This is why Einstein said, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. For the quantum field governs, organizes, and unifies all the laws of nature and is always directing energy into order by patterning light into form. On our own planet, we need only look at nature to see how Fibonacci's sequence, otherwise known as the golden ratio, a recurring mathematical formula found throughout nature that brings about order and coherence, brings order to matter. It's the zero-point field made of possibilities or thought, because thoughts are possibilities, that is slowing its frequency down, creating order and form. The unified field is a self-organizing intelligence that is always observing the material world into order and form. The more you can surrender to it, move closer to it, and become one with it, the less separation and lack you feel, and thus the more wholeness and oneness you experience. When you as an awareness unfold into this infinite realm of possibilities, you begin to feel connected to the consciousness of everyone, everybody, everywhere, everything, in every time, including your future dreams. Since consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention, the first step to experiencing the unified field is to become aware of it, because if you're not aware of it, it doesn't exist. Thus the more you pay attention to this field, the more you will become aware of it. There is a caveat, however. As we've seen, the only way you can enter the realm of pure consciousness is to become pure consciousness. In other words, the only way to enter this kingdom of thought is as a thought. This means you have to get beyond your senses by taking your awareness off matter and particles and instead place it on energy or the wave. If you can unfold as an awareness into this unseen, immaterial realm of infinite blackness and become aware that you are an awareness in the presence of a greater awareness, your consciousness will merge with a greater consciousness. If you can do this, if you can get out of the way and linger as a consciousness or awareness in this field, if you can keep surrendering to this intelligent love, the same innate intelligence that's creating the universe and giving you life, it's going to consume you. This loving intelligence is both personal and universal, within you and all around you, and when it consumes you, it's going to create and restore order and balance in your biology, because its very nature is to organize matter in a more coherent way. Now you are moving through the eye of the needle, 
and on the other side of the eye, there is no longer the separation of two points of consciousness. There is one consciousness, or oneness. This is where all possibilities exist. Because you are entering the domain of consciousness, thought, information, energy and frequency, the bridge that gets you from space-time to time-space is going from being somebody, someone, something, in some place, in some time, to being nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, in no time. This is the nexus, the threshold to the unified or quantum field. Go back and review figures 11.8 and 11.9. In this realm of infinite unknown possibilities, unlimited new potentials and experiences await you, not the same old familiar ones that you've experienced time and time again. After all, isn't that what the unknown is? An unknown is just a possibility that exists to you as a new thought. When you are in this realm of pure thought, as a thought, the only thing limiting you is your imagination. But when in this realm of thought, if you find yourself thinking again about someone, something, somebody, somewhere, in some known time, your awareness, and thus your energy, is back in the known reality of three-dimensional space and time, back to the realm of separation. Since every thought you think has a frequency, the moment you start thinking about the pain in your body, or the advancement of your disease, or the problems at work, or the issues you have with your mother, or the things you must do within a certain amount of time, you are back in this space and time. Your awareness is back in the realm of the material world, and your thoughts are producing the same frequency equal to matter and particles. Review figure 11.10. Your energy is back to vibrating at the same level of the known physical world of three-dimensional reality, so you exert less of an effect on your personal reality. You are back to vibrating as matter, and we know how that goes. As your frequency moves further and further into density, you are moving further and further away from the unified field. As a result, you feel separate from it. In this scenario, if your dreams exist as thoughts in the unified field, it's going to take a lot of time for your dreams to come true. If you are thinking about somebody, someone, something, at some place, in some time, you are not getting beyond your identity, which has been shaped by the totality of your past experiences. You are literally still in the same memories, habitual thoughts, and conditioned emotions that you've associated with all the familiar people and things at certain times and places in your known reality, which means your attention and energy are bound to your past, present, personal reality. You're thinking equal to your identity, so your life is going to stay the same. You're the same personality, trying to create a new personal reality. When I say you have to get beyond yourself, it means to forget about yourself. Take your attention off your personality and your past personal reality. It makes sense then that to heal your body, you're going to have to get beyond your body. To create something new in your life, you're going to have to forget about your same old life. To change some problem in your external environment, you're going to have to get beyond your memory and the corresponding emotions related to that problem. And if you want to create a new, unexpected event in your future timeline, you'll have to stop unconsciously anticipating the same predictable future based on your familiar memories of the past. You are going to have to move to a greater level of consciousness than the consciousness that created any of those realities. In the unified field, there is nowhere to go because you are everywhere. There is nothing you can want because you are so whole and complete that you feel like you have everything. You can't judge anyone because you are everyone and it's no longer necessary to become anybody, because you are everybody. And why would you be worried that there is never enough time if you exist in a domain where there's infinite time? The more whole you feel, the less lack you experience, and therefore the less you want. How can you want or live in lack when you feel whole? If there is less lack, there is less of the need to create from duality, polarity and separation. How can you want when you're whole? When you create from wholeness, you feel like you already have it. There is no longer wanting, trying, wishing, forcing, predicting, fighting or hoping. After all, hope is a beggar. When you create from a state of wholeness, there are only knowing and observing. This is the key to manifesting reality, being connected, not separate. If time in your three-dimensional world is created by the illusion of space between two objects, or two points of consciousness, then the more one you are with the unified field, the less separation there is between you and everything material. 
When your consciousness merges or becomes more connected to the unified field, to the realm of wholeness and unity, there is no longer separation between two points of consciousness. This wholeness is then reflected in your biology, chemistry, circuitry, hormones, genes, heart and brain, thus restoring balance to your entire system. A greater frequency or energy is now moving through your autonomic nervous system, a system that continuously gives you life, whose agenda it is to create balance and order. This energy is carrying a message of wholeness, and as a result you become more holy. The greater the frequency you experience, the shorter amount of time it takes to unfold in this three-dimensional space-time reality. As we learned earlier in this chapter, when you diminish the space between two points of consciousness, you collapse time. When this illusion of separation no longer exists, you perceive less space between you, an identity living in a body in a physical environment in linear time, and people, objects, things, places, matter, and even your dreams. Therefore, the closer you move to the unified field, the more connected you feel you are to everyone and everything. You as a consciousness are in the realm of oneness, and because there is no separation, time is eternal. And remember, when there is infinite time, there are infinite spaces, possible dimensions and realities to be experienced. Wherever you think you are, or whoever you think you are, you are. In fact, there is nothing to try to create because it already exists as a thought in the realm of all thoughts. All you have to do is to become aware of it and observe it into being by experiencing it. Take a peek at figure 11.12 to follow along. As you do this and move your attention from being somebody to being nobody to becoming everybody, you can create anybody. As you move from living as someone to becoming no one to being everyone, you can become anyone. As you can take your attention off something, move into the realm of no thing, you merge with everything. Thus you can have anything. As you move your awareness from somewhere to nowhere, you will be everywhere, and you can live anywhere. And finally, when you shift your consciousness from some time to no time, to become every time, you can be in any time. Now that's becoming supernatural. In the work I do around the world, I have labored for many years teaching our students how to get beyond themselves. I now know the first step in this process is for them to master their body, get beyond the conditions in their external environment, and transcend time. When they accomplish that, they find themselves on the precipice of experiencing the unified field. Once they arrive at this nexus, however, they must be taught that there is even more to experience. If learning means making new synaptic connections, the more you learn about something, the more you can appreciate it, become aware of it, and experience it because now you can engage it with a new set of neural networks. It is in the act of learning that you further change or enrich your experience. After all, if you haven't learned anything new, your experience will probably stay the same since you're perceiving reality with the same neural circuitry as before. Knowledge is the harbinger that evolves your experience. For example, I love red wine and I lead several wine tours a year in different parts of the world. Many people who come to these week-long events initially tell me that they know nothing about wine. How I translate this statement is that they probably never learned anything about, or have had limited exposure to, the fermented grape. The truth of the matter is that because they have limited knowledge and experience from their past, they have very limited neural hardware installed to perceive any real taste or nuance. We could say then that they just don't know what to look for to truly enjoy the experience. But what if they learn how winemakers produce wine and understand its history, the type of grapes they use and why they are used? Then they learn about how the wine is stored in oak barrels, for how long and why. This would familiarize them with the whole process and reasoning as to what makes a particular wine so enjoyable. That's the process, but now think of that great wine in the bottle. If they are not aware of the plum flavor, the notes of black cherry and currants, its hints of vanilla and leather, the smell of its floral perfumes, its percentage of tannins, and whether it was aged in oak barrels or stainless steel drums, and for how long, then they don't know what to look for, and they are not going to be able to fully experience it. Only in the moment when they know what to look for, and what to become aware of, does it exist. We could say then that their awareness changes their experience. I know this to be true because in just one week, those same people who initially said they didn't like red wine, or knew nothing about it, walk away with a whole new experience of interacting with it. After many full days of learning and discovering what to look for, 
repeatedly staying present and focusing all their awareness on specific flavors and aromas, day after day experiencing all types of wines and deciding what they like and don't like, continuously paying attention and therefore firing, wiring, and assembling new neural connections, those folks get very specific about what type of wine they like. In one week, they gain a whole new level of appreciation, awareness, and understanding. Again, the experience changed them. The same is true when it comes to the unified field. If you are not aware of it, then it doesn't exist for you. Yet the more you know about it, and the more aware you are of what to look for, the more you can pay attention to it with your awareness and experience it more deeply. And it should change you. Starting at birth, you are trained to keep your attention on matter and not on energy. You are conditioned into believing you need your senses to experience reality. In other words, if you don't see, hear, feel, smell, touch, or taste something, it doesn't exist. Because of this, the majority of people place most of their attention on matter, objects, and the particle, while taking very little time to put their attention on energy, information, and the wave. For instance, you are not aware of your big toe on your left foot until you put your attention on it. It has always existed for you, but you were unaware of it. The moment you put your awareness on it, however, it comes into being. The same is true for the unified field. The more you become aware of it, the more it will exist in your reality. By focusing solely on matter, people exclude possibility from their life. That's what the wave is, an energy of possibility. The more you pay attention to it, the more possibilities should show up in your life. Because wherever you place your attention is where you place your energy. The moment you become aware of the unified field, your attention upon it causes it to expand. For example, when you place your attention and awareness on your pain, it expands, because you experience more of it. If you keep attending to your pain and experiencing more and more of it, it becomes a part of your life. The same thing also happens with the unified field. When you place your attention on it and become more aware of it, it expands. And just as I said about pain, when you experience more of it, it exists as part of your life. Simply by placing your attention on the unified field, as you become aware of it, notice it, experience it, feel it, interact with it, and stay present with it moment after moment, it shows up and unfolds in your reality on a daily basis. How does it show up and unfold? as unknowns, serendipities, synchronicities, opportunities, coincidences, luck, being in the right place at the right time, and moments filled with awe. In my best description from experience, this unified field is a divine, loving intelligence and an intelligent love that is within and around you. So each time you focus your attention on it, you are becoming aware of the presence of the divine within and all around you. As you place your attention on it, the divine should appear more in your life. Since consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention, when you are aware of it and pay attention to it, you begin to merge with it. Your experience of it will literally cause you to become it. And as you unfold deeper and deeper into this unified field, there's more and more for you to explore and experience. If you look at figure 11.11 again, as you move closer and closer to that straight line that represents source energy or oneness, it makes sense that the only way you can move closer to it is by keeping your attention on it and becoming more conscious of it. If you do this correctly, as you journey away from duality or separation and toward unity and oneness, since feelings are the end product of experience, you should feel more and more levels of love, unity and wholeness. Once you feel and experience more of this intelligent love, three things happen in your life. The first thing that happens is that as you place your attention and awareness on the unified field, as you move closer to source and deeper into it, you experience more of it. That journey carves a neurological path from your thinking brain straight to your autonomic nervous system. Now each time you venture deeper into it, as you slow your brain waves down, you're building a neurological highway with more lanes, and that neuro pathway becomes thicker because you are using it more. Over time, this enables you to more easily merge with the field. The second thing that happens is that because experience enriches the brain, each time you interact with this unified field and experience it, your brain changes. This is what experience does. It enriches and refines brain circuitry. Now you are installing the hardware in your brain to be more aware of this field the next time you merge with it. Likewise, since experience produces an emotion, as you feel the unified field, you begin to embody it. Thus you embody more of the divine. 
According to the quantum model of reality, since all disease is a lowering and incoherency of frequency, the moment the body experiences this new coherent elevated frequency, the energy from that event raises the body's vibration into coherence and order. Numerous times in our advanced workshops around the world, when our students' bodies have been upgraded by a new frequency and new information, we have witnessed instantaneous changes in their health. Since the autonomic nervous system's agenda is to create balance and health, the instant we get out of its way, stop analyzing, cease thinking and fully surrender, this intelligence steps in and creates order. But this time it's carrying a newer, more self-organizing message with a greater frequency from the unified field. That very same coherent energy raises the frequency of matter. It's like changing the frequency of a static field radio station to one that is carrying a clear frequency and signal. The body is receiving a more coherent signal. When this happens, you will feel intense love, a profound joy for existence, a heightened sense of freedom, indescribable bliss, an awe for life, elevated levels of gratitude, and a humbled sense of true empowerment. In that moment, the energy from the unified field, in the form of emotion, is reconditioning your body to a new consciousness and a new mind. In a heartbeat, the elevated emotions signal new genes and new ways, changing your body and moving it out of your biological past. The third thing that happens as you move closer toward the unified field is that you begin to hear or experience knowledge and information differently. That's because you've changed your brain circuits and are no longer the same person. You will meet truth on a whole new level, and things that you thought you knew will seem like a brand new encounter. Your inner experience has changed your perception of what is happening in your outer world. In other words, you've awakened. Once you have an experience, a feeling, or better understanding of the unified field, once it changes your brain circuitry, it allows you to experience and perceive reality in new ways. In fact, you will see a spectrum of life that your brain did not have the circuitry to perceive before. The next time your brain fires those networks, you already have the hardware to experience even more of the reality. You are now perceiving more of a reality that has always existed. You merely lacked the circuits to perceive it previously. If on a consistent basis, you can make this journey all the way to source, see figure 11.11 again, and connect with it, the moment you truly interact with it, you will begin to behave more like it. Its nature becomes your nature, and now more intelligent love is being expressed through you. What are its innate qualities? You will become more patient, forgiving, present, conscious, aware, willful, giving, selfless, loving, and mindful, to name but a few of them. You realize that which you have been seeking is seeking you. You become it, and it becomes you. The discipline, then, is to allow your consciousness to merge with a greater consciousness. Surrender deeper into intelligent love. Trust in the unknown. Continuously surrender some aspect of the limited self to join the greater self. Lose yourself in nothing to become everything. Relax into an infinite deep sea of coherent energy. Keep unfolding deeper and deeper into oneness. Continuously let go of control. Feel greater and greater degrees of wholeness. And finally, as a consciousness, moment by moment, become aware, pay attention to, experience, be present with, and feel more and more of this unified field all around you, without returning your awareness back to three-dimensional reality. If you do this properly, you won't be using any of your senses because you're beyond your senses. You'll simply be awareness. Space-time, time-space meditation. Begin by resting your awareness on your heart, and once you are locked in on the space your heart occupies in space, become aware of your breathing. Allow it to flow in and out of your heart, all the while deepening and relaxing your breath. Keeping your attention on your heart, call up an elevated emotion and sustain this feeling for a period of time while paying attention to your breathing. Radiate that energy beyond your body in space. Next, using any song that inspires you, like the one you used for the meditation in Chapter 5, do that meditation to pull the mind out of the body. 
Take all the energy stored in your body as survival emotions and liberate it into elevated emotions, using a level of intensity that is greater than the body as the mind. For the next 10 to 15 minutes, listen to one or two songs without lyrics that will induce trance. Now become pure consciousness, becoming no one, no body, no thing, nowhere, in no time, unfolding as an awareness into the unified field. Now it's time to become connected to the consciousness of everyone, everybody, everything, everywhere, in every time, unifying with a greater consciousness in the unified field. All you have to do is become aware of this field, pay attention to it, Stay present with it and feel it moment by moment. You will begin to feel more wholeness and oneness, which will be reflected in your biology because your body is experiencing more coherent energy moving through it and you are building your energy field. Maintain this state for about 10 to 20 minutes, surrendering deeper and deeper into it. When you're done, bring your awareness back to a new body to a new environment and to a whole new time.